doesn't it always come back to what is meaningful to them? Because and, and I might argue that you know if my glutes are quote unquote misfiring or inhibited or lazy, whatever you want to call it, and doing a Jane Fonda hip, you know, laying on your side, lifting your leg up. I won't, I won't uh, show you, but you know what I'm getting at. And and doing and doing uh, one, I age myself by saying Jane Fonda, but but the the point is is that we could do something like that to turn quote unquote turn on the muscle, but does that really translate to what someone really wants to do? Welcome to the Movement Code Podcast, where we help you decode movement, health, and lifestyle so that you can expand and grow. Hey guys, my name is Antonio Gurley, your host for the Movement Code Podcast. I am a father, husband business owner, rehab practitioner, and coach. Information overload has paralyzed many of us and we are overwhelmed with good intentions and don't know what or who to trust. We aim to provide you clarity and confidence by bringing you expert advice for the everyday person. Thanks for spending some time with me today and enjoy the episode. All right, guys, welcome back. This is episode four of the Movement Code podcast. We have been loving all of our interviews and our chats thus far. We have already recorded uh, quite a few, but we're we're kind of batching them out and spreading them out so that we can, uh, you know, s- spread out all the content that we've done thus far and not just drop it on you guys all at once because we want you to be able to digest all of this information um, and really be, you know, have the opportunity to apply it to your everyday lives. Today on our episode, we have Capo on the show. And as you'll hear in, in just a minute here, the introduction, uh, it kind of threw him off. Capo is a great friend of Michelle and mine. And we actually met him out in California um, while we were in grad school or in our chiropractic program, and he, as he had, as he is also a Palmer West grad, and he had a practice out there, and he was highly involved with the school and giving back to the students. Um, and we've just known him for a number of years, and he's been, you know, just an absolutely amazing person. Uh, Michelle and I always joke he is by far one of the nicest people we've ever met, but he's also just so knowledgeable about the human body and how we look at movement. And this this comes off clearly in his passion that he um, that he shows with his company that he's a part of with Rock Tape, and he's always giving back to other providers and other students. And it's just just such a just such a blessing, and honestly, always a great time chatting with him. So I know you guys will love the show. We got a lot of great information here. Uh, you know, learning about how to ride horses and how much water you should drink. So uh, be sure to stay tuned towards the end again. That's when we give you guys your next weekly challenge, and we want to be able to hear what that is so that you can uh, start taking advantage of that in the next week. So thanks for tuning in, guys, and I hope you enjoy. One last thing before we start, I did forget to mention here, we wanted to throw out an offer for our listeners, all five of you. So it's, you know, the chances that you could win this is pretty good thus far. We are offering out one free movement assessment. This can be virtual or in the office if you are local here in Colorado. But we're offering up one free movement assessment. You have to put your name in the raffle, though. So the only way that you can do this is you have to go on uh, Instagram. You have to like our page. Sorry, follow our page on Instagram. That is just movement code, okay? And then you have to DM us. You have to DM us movement code 2020. Movement code 2020, that is going to be just the code for you to enter into the raffle. And uh, I also want you guys to make a post or a story where you tag movement code of you listening to this podcast. You can just have you, you know, a picture of you with your headset in, tag movement code. You can do a post yourself uh, and just put something in there. So three things you have to do. You got to follow us. You have to take a picture uh, and tag us either stories or in your or, or make an actual post, and then you have to DM us movement code twenty twenty in order for you to enter in that raffle to get that free movement assessment. All right, guys, on with the episode. All right, welcome back to the Movement Code Podcast. Today we have a good friend of mine, uh, a mentor of Nichelle and, and Nichelle and mine. Uh, out from uh, our alma mater at Palmer West, we have Dr. Steve Capo on the show. 
Hey, welcome. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I we talked about this offline, so it caught me off guard. I thought you were going to say the entire last name, but uh, Doctor Capo looks just fine. Steve, Doc. probably. Steve Capo, a man of many names. <laughs> yeah, now. That's- now, now uh, we I and I, I threw myself off guard. I normally reach out to him as Capo, and he probably yeah. is more familiar with that name. So that's probably why he. That's like someone calling me Anthony. My legal name is Anthony, and I don't respond because that's my dad's name. So I apologize for throwing you off. But uh, Capo is an educator, a teacher, an author, and a fellow movement geek, and uh, currently the medical director for Rock Tape. So he handles uh, a very large, extensive team. Puts and they put out a ton of curriculum and content around movement. Most of us know rock tape as kinesiology tape, but as you instantaneously will notice and see, and, and after talking with them or even looking at the website, it's more of a movement company. They do more than just kinesiology tape. They have a lot of different products out there from rock pods and instrument assisted soft tissue devices. So if you guys are interested in any of that stuff, obviously be sure to check out rock tapes uh, website, but that's rock tape. Where can people connect with you, Capo? Where can they learn more about what you're doing and follow you? Uh, Social media-wise, I'm probably most active on Instagram. um, And that's uh, somewhat problematic. But the handle is called Fascia Doc, F-A-S-C-I-A-D-O-C. And to explain that a little bit further, I'm pretty interested in this layer of tissue just below our skin, which is coin the fascial system or the connective tissue system and I think it's another uh, component of the anatomy that that not only you know, the uh, end user the patient or client doesn't know about even the clinicians like like you and I are just learning about but I think um, it's an important thing to consider and that's why I just coined myself the fascia doc because I dive quite deep into the science and anatomy the utility of this network to help us move more effectively and efficiently. Well, again, uh, check out Capo on Instagram. Uh, if out of the fascial system, uh, which is what something we're going to chat about a little bit further down the road here. Um, this is the guy I go to cause he's done a, a, a tremendous amount of research, uh, about it. And, and I trust everything he says, and it's, it's been really cl- very valuable in how we treat our patients and address our clients. But, before we get down the rabbit hole, you're a cowboy now down in Texas, right? You guys got a couple horses. I'm, I'm yeah. curious. I've never ridden a horse, but how is it? What's it been like learning a brand new skill such as riding a horse when you're tied to and dependent on another animal's behaviors in action? Oh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, so I'd be the best to explain that scenario as a novice. Uh, my wife and daughter are the the uh, kind of the up and coming uh, equine specialists. Uh, I'm the newbie. And um, I think the experience as a novice on an animal of that size, learning how to navigate movement with that size of, of uh, an organism underneath you is uh, pretty um, unnerving. And the reason I say that is that you think you have control of your own body, but then uh, you get on top of an animal like that and learning to move from point A to point B uh, while steering this animal is almost like relearning how to move all together. Uh, you pull the rein on your right side to be able to steer the horse in this direction and, and vice versa. And so the experience has been almost like relearning how to uh, roll over, how to breathe, how to roll over, crawl, you know, step and walk and run. So that's how I kind of explain it is just relearning how to move again, just with an, a, a thousand to 3000 pound animal underneath you. <laughs> I, I, I can't even imagine. And it's funny you had mentioned that too, talking about the reins. I mean, I've, I've ridden bikes my whole life for a br- very brief period of time out in California. I had a motorcycle and which was, if you've never ridden a motorcycle before, the Bay area is not a time to start riding a motorcycle. If you live in the Bay area, uh, but needless to say, when I was learning how to ride a motorcycle, I thought it was interesting how when they talk about turning, it seems instinctual to to pull handlebars to turn the handlebars. 
but you actually did more of a pushing rather than a pulling. And for a while there, it just took me in, in our little parking lot session of learning. It took me a long time to really kind of understand how that piece together. But once you get it, it's seamless. And yeah. It was, and here's another point. And it's, it's a great point. And so I've done some motocross back in my day and it's not only just the, and this is what you and I probably as, as the novice would think that it's got to be the reins or the handlebars. In fact, it's more of, of changing position and pressure. So when I was riding and I'd be in the air, it's not you know the contact point of my butt on the seat and my hands on the handlebar. It's actually my legs squeezing the bike to have control of it in space. The same thing's true with a horse. And trust me, I'm not the expert, but putting slight pressure on the inside of my right thigh to the flank side of the horse will cue the horse to do something compared to the other side. And that to me is like what I'm saying, relearning how to move is learning how to navigate reins, pressures, position, posture, all those things matter. And it this applies to how I teach movement in general. It's like you have to know where your body's in space to be able to move it effectively on a horse completely different game <laughs> yeah you mean you throw three thousand pounds in the mix now you have a whole new mapping <laughs> system yeah and and an increase in threat so <laughs> i you know i just they they can smell it they can sense it <laughs> immediately so i think horses would be a great clinician to be able to pick up on pain but they can sense threat and so i'm not the most comfortable on a horse because i haven't navigated how to manipulate the experience and so that's been going back to your initial question the whole experience has just been a cerebral one more than a physical one yeah that's awesome now that being said um what are in and this is again kind of our world and i think every a lot of the, our listeners would probably agree when we say this is there's there's a lot of focus around the hips the glutes in particular right like build the glutes okay. make the glutes strong externally rotate torque in how can we yeah. maybe add into the conversation using more of the adductors inward rotation inward squeezing into our movement uh, literacy or our movement mapping programs to maybe make efficiency, maybe make our movement more efficiency or make our movement a little bit stronger. The, the focus seems to be, and the same is for the shoulders, right? We think everything's just yeah. inwardly rotated. So we always want to go outwardly rotated. Yes, we do find there's more stability and torque and tension there, but the adductors are a big component. Yeah. I think adductors uh, are misinterpreted. And so like, you know, I, I take it as, uh, creating balance. Uh, I'm not a I'm not a big person in respect to symmetry because that's that's a term that's used all too often that we want to create symmetry almost like a machine. We we want our bodies to behave like a robot and if there's any asymmetry in a machine it breaks down so we feel that we need the same thing in our own bodies. And I I'm saying this because there's a a recent um a report a news report that was released on a research that was done with Usain Bolt did you happen to see that at all mm -hmm. uh, so the uh, what they what the researchers found on the fastest man on this planet is that he had a significant asymmetry in his gait the fastest man on two feet had significant uh, imbalance from one foot to the other in fact he landed with 13 percent more force on his right foot and he spent 13 to 15% more time on the ground with his left foot. So that point saying is that I'm not looking for symmetry because that that is all dependent on what you're trying to achieve um, and your own body, your body's architecture, how you were made. Um, but balance is, is telling your nervous system that I need just as much you know, external rotation or external torque, like you say, when it comes to the glutes, but I need to have control of that on the internal rotators and adductors being the inside of my thigh. That's how I approach when it comes to you know, modulating or helping people move is that they're told a lot of things, that your glutes are misfiring or um, they're inhibited, all these terms that people are thrown with and they say, well, if my glutes aren't strong, I better strengthen external rotation, abduction. And I say, well, I think you need to look at it more in a complex system 
um, and, and identify how you can create balance around that joint. And that includes the adductors. I'm not sure if that answered the question, but uh, that's my approach is definitely looking at balance of AB and AD duction when it comes to the hip. Yeah, no, I, I 100% agree. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, doesn't Usain Bolt have scoliosis? He does. So, you know, so you another look, asymmetry. And, and again, coming from uh, both, for, for the listeners who don't know, we did address Capo as Dr. Capo. We both, by training, are chiropractors, right? And this is a big topic of conversation mm-hmm. in the chiropractic world of fixing scoliosis curves. Now, can we improve or reduce the amount of severity of the curve? I think there's some research that shows that is possible. And the Scroth method talks about that a lot, which is really interesting. Have you heard of the Scroth method yeah. before? I have, yeah. And, and it's all about the breath and using internal pressure, which I thought was very fascinating. But that being said, I like what you talked about misfiring. And, and it was a question I had later down the road about how we have so much of this conversation coming up about misfiring or dominance issues. And what I like to just tell people is, okay, well, if you feel like your glutes are misfiring, let's do this movement. Now go back and flick your butt or hit your butt. It seems to be firing to me, you know, it's, it wouldn't, if it's not firing, it's there, but to, to, to make it a little bit more understandable is like, how do we put it into the system, the complex system? How do we address it into movement maybe a little bit more efficiently so that they can have a better feeling or a better interpretation of what firing of the glutes would actually mean? Right. And, and don't you think, and maybe I'll just kind of rebound the question back to you is that, and this, this applies to anyone that's listening, regardless if you're a clinician or just someone that wants to move their body better, is that doesn't it always come back to what is meaningful to them? Because, and, and I might argue that, you know, if my glutes are quote unquote misfiring or inhibited or lazy, whatever you want to call it. And doing a Jane Fonda, hit, you know, laying on your side, lifting your leg up. I won't, I won't uh, show you, but you know <laughs> what I'm getting at. And and doing and doing uh, one, I age myself by saying Jane Fonda, but but <laughs> the the point is, is that we could do something like that to turn quote unquote turn on the muscle. But does that really translate to what someone really wants to do? I feel better if we're going back to our balance conversation. Is that I want to put them in a position that is similar to something that they want to get back to that's safe and reasonable for their, where they're at, uh, and then make them work. And that would include firing their glutes and co-contracting or activating their adductors, their flexors, their core, their breath. Um, so, that, you know, I think, and I know your answer already, because we think alike in this sense, but that that to me is more valuable of, of getting someone to figure it out, uh, which might include glute activation for someone that just says that, you know, they need glutes and putting them on the floor and having them do a clamshell or a Jane Fonda. Yeah, no, I agree. And uh, it's it's funny because I, I think I think my opinion of that to almost a fault is on day one. If someone comes in and they're like, I can't do deadlift squats. I obviously work with a lot more people doing weightlifting or whatever that might be because of pain or this issue, whatever that might've been. I that's, I'm like, sweet, let's forego any other like orthopedic assessment thing that I thought I was going to do. And let's just start squatting. Let's just start moving. Let's just start putting some load on it so that you have, um, maybe some sort of cueing or interpretation right next to you real time to make those changes happen. And, and on that note with that is coming back to those differences, something that came to mind when you were talking about Usain's bolt asymmetries is I had a a gentleman who was a strength conditioning coach, CrossFit coach, uh, very smart, well-read dude. And he came to me with a disc herniation, annular tear. And it was, it was, uh, uh, I was initiated mostly through squatting. Hinging was fine for him. But what we finally figured out was he was a center. He played center for football for 15 plus years from the age that he was six. So when you drop down into a center's position, he's not bilateral. One foot's back and staggered open. And what it, when we started evaluating him, he essentially had retroversion of that hip structurally just like a baseball player would but he was trying to squat toes forward 
in a in a very controlled box setting and over time that just wore him down and then we uh, then when we say i'm like well show me how you would set up for you know um uh your stance on the line and then he squatted from there and he's like it's like butter it's just smooth i'm like sweet there you go yeah. that's what you should be doing from now on yeah i love it i mean and you're speaking my language is that whatever's meaningful to someone or at least that they have control of that decreases the anxiety around a movement that they might experience pain in uh, is the win. And so, you know, you are going to be an outlier. I teach, you know, worldwide and I teach quite a bit within our profession. And the, the thought still, even though we're in 2020, I think, uh, of this pandemic, I don't even know what year <laughs> we're in, but uh, the, um, the, the thought is still conduct these orthopedic tests because that's what we learned in our formal education and they don't really translate to the patient. They don't necessarily give us any more information of really what to do with them unless they're having an obvious positive, which I've been in practice almost 20 years, Doc. And, and I'll tell you, I probably have seen uh, 20, and I'm saying two zero true positive orthopedic signs within my career. I've seen probably 10 ACL, you know, obvious drawer signs that I know is torn. I've seen one straight leg orthopedic positive, true positive, and I can't tell you the other ones, maybe some, you know, knee cartilage, you know, orthopedics, but your approach of, of giving someone a meaningful movement that they come in and say, I'm coming to see you because I got pain, and I had pain when I squat and squat is my jam. That's what I want to do. Why not use that as your measure to say, how do I get you to move more effectively with less pain? And I can't see why that's wrong. I really don't. Uh, so on that note, which, uh, you know, obviously I use the example of squatting. Uh, I'm, I, I believe it was power to the people, Pavel's book, power to the people. It talks about how mm -hmm. squatting is really a man, man-made movement. But we yet we label it as such a functional exercise that we do, right? And and a lot of it's yeah. like, well, you get up and down off the toilet or a chair, all man-made things, right? But in reality, deadlifts are way more functional. And there are obviously variations. To me, squatting and deadlifts are really the same thing. Yes, there's more of a hinge component than like a bilateral knee, but really what do you do? If you pick up a rock, you have to hinge down, you pick it up, and then you might drop down like an atlas stone, which then resembles more of a squat to then stand up. But I find it interesting that that squatting is pretty I mean, man made up as far as a functional task. I don't know your opinions on it. You know what? I like it. actually, <laughs> And uh, I just, yeah, I really haven't kind of broken it down that way. There's a... Um, I am complete in agreement that I believe that the the hinge movement, and I think you said you were going to be having Dan John coming out uh, pretty soon as one of your guests on this podcast. I'm not sure if I um, spoke too too soon, but uh, Dan, I've been following his work for quite some time, and Dan talks about his five core movements, and obviously hinge is one of them. Uh, and he, he kind of talks about the hinge being the fundamental pattern that we need to own and uh, before we should be uh, really asking to load the system. And I completely agree. So um, the squat, the only reason I brought up the squat was that if that's a meaningful movement, I don't care if it's a, uh, a triple jump is their meaningful movement or parallel bar um you know round off whatever that may be <laughs> i don't care uh, i don't need to be the expert in any movement like horses for example i work with some riders now and i'm not the expert in riding but i can break down any movement into the dan john you know core movement patterns and then i can start to break those down into what is needed both uh, mechanically what does the body need to do to make that shape and what does it need neurologically you know what muscles need to fire to be able to get yourself into that position so the squat is just an example but i totally agree that the hinge is a fundamental pattern that we should all own before we load our system 
Yeah, I, I, I love it. And, and I've been trying to just, and on that note uh, with Dan John's stuff, it's just simplicity, right? Is breaking down, get, taking, taking, yeah. the, taking the complexity of what movement actually is and then boiling it down because we can't fully always replicate the exact same thing, but we know that when we do these basic movements, right, there's huge carryover and bleed over to all these other elements. So true. Um, I, so I wanted, I wanted to bring up, um, I actually, I, the first time I came across the Brazilian study, you know, the Brazilian study, right, was from one of your rock tape courses. And it clearly defines the importance of movement and mobility as we age. Most of most people probably don't know about the Brazilian paper, um, but they know as we age, losing mobility is looked at as almost normal and you can't really fight it. It's kind of like, ah, oh, it's a part of the process of getting old, right? Um, yeah, can you right. Share, a little bit how, share a little bit about the study and how we can fight this aging battle of immobility or whatever that might be? Yeah, I think um, it's more complex than just immobility, but I get what your point is. And the study was probably one of the first, and there's now been uh, follow-up studies in respect to this idea, but this was the first study that I know of that uh, made some correlation or at least a relationship between how you move to how long you live. Don't, don't even talk about how you move to how long your knees will, you know, be with you or how long your back will sustain. Um, it's just, it really can make a relationship between this is how you move and this is how long you may live. And so what they did was, is they took 2000 people. So it's a large sample size. Uh, this was, uh, they called it the Brazilian study because the researchers came out of Brazil and it was done in 2012. And um, so they took these, these 2000 people ranging in ages of, 51 to 80, so like the older, you know, um, category of, of people, the category of people I'm getting up to 50 years old. And so quite often I say, gosh, I just feel old today because I just don't feel like I'm moving so fluidly. So like when you start getting to that mid-century point, you start kind of identifying yourself as old. And so old has a connotation that I'm not going to move as well or as much, which is all incorrect. But the point was is that they took that category of people and said, how are you moving? And the movement that they did, I wonder if I could show you here. I'll try to oh, show yeah, you yeah. What, they asked them to, what they asked them to do was, let's see if I can take this up. There we go. So they asked them from a standing position, they just said, sit to the floor. They didn't give them any other instructions. They go sit to the floor. So they were scored five points for sitting and five points for standing. But as they accomplished the task with those instructions, sit to the floor and stand back up, everyone had a different strategy. So some of them would drop down to one knee. That would be one point off. My hand would be two points off. My thigh would be three. So three out of the five would have been removed uh, from your score of 10. And then coming up was even more challenging for people. So one point would be my foot or heel. Two would be my knee. Three would have been in my hand, four would have been my knee again, and then standing back up. So let's say four on the get up and uh, three for the get down. So I would have had a score of seven for that get up and get down. Those people were followed for six years. And what they found was 159 people died. Let's be clear, not during the sitting and standing, but during those six years, 159 people perished. And the interesting thing in that research was the majority of those that passed away were those with the lowest scores, the ones that had the most points removed when they did the sit to stand. They took a cohort of that study and they taught them how to do that movement with less contact points. So they improved their score through movement correction and they had a reduction for every point that was removed from their score. Um, maybe I should say, for every point that was improved on, they had a 21% reduction in, in risk of death. I, I can't tell you how telling that is to me, is that movement matters. And that is one of the mantras of our education that I foster within our platform, that movement matters. And even knowing how to get up off the ground um, matters. So that's what that study was all about. And I think it was something to, to take to heart. Now, I'm, I'm curious, too, just uh, 
kind of your interpretation and perspective. How much of that do you think was, because I, I, uh, I, I agree with you, I was kind of loading the question more towards immobility, but how much of that is yeah. more so strength deficits? Yeah, I think it's a little bit of both. So that's why I kind of, you know, harped on the idea of immobility. I think it's a component of two things. Uh, and if you follow um, what some would call the joint by joint uh, approach is really there's a relationship of the body that certain certain body parts require. That's my light. Certain body parts require mobility. Some body parts need more stability. So I kind of break it down as if I'm going to be doing this movement. And I'm going to slide this over again. If I'm going to be doing this movement, uh, I'm to be able to sit to the floor with the least amount of points, a lot of people would cross their ankles and then sit all the way down. So sitting all the way down, there would be no points lost here. Uh, and then coming back up is the same thing. It is coming up that way. So that would have been a perfect score in that setting. What is required for me to do that motion? You could start to you know, make your own assessment. I need to have range of motion of my ankles, so mobility out of my ankles. I need to have stability of my knees. I need to have mobility of my hips, stability of my trunk, uh, and we can go up the chain that way. And so just remember, people don't know this, but I don't have an ACL on either knee. So what you know, some people would say, not having an ACL, you should have no stability there. Well, I trained my body to be able to stabilize my own knees even without an ACL. Mm -hmm. So the point is, you need both. I need to be able to have the mobility and stability to do movements like this as a 50 year old man. So that's no excuse. Love it. Love it. Yeah. I find, I find that uh, super interesting, especially just as, I mean, I, I work with th that population as well. My parents are in that population and, and having the conversations with them constantly. Cause I think a lot of the thought process again is like just static stretching because our muscles feel tight and then we're afraid to lift right. weights. So it's a lot of light weights, high, high reps. I mean, five, 10 pounds and you're doing sets, you're doing like five sets of 20. You know what I mean? Almost right. to the point where it's just like you're flapping your arms up because it looks so light and trying to encourage more joint joint stress, which would be deemed usually as bad, right? But joint stress to improve stability around the knee or to train the joint capsules of the hip. But more importantly, is like getting under some fairly challenging load that makes you sweat a little bit. It makes you think about what you're actually doing. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. It's, it's just kind of identifying, you know, there's multiple systems that we need to uh, uh, effect to be able to improve our ability to move and the, the five sets of 20 is you're looking at that sub threshold level still important mm -hmm. but is it going to be is it going to be a, a strength need that you have when you lose your balance and you have to quickly kick one leg out to support your own body weight which is a high load uh, reflexively otherwise you fall at 75, 80 years old and break a hip. And we know what the statistics say on that. So I think it's critical for people when we're looking at conditioning is to understand what are the needs of your of our body. And our needs span from strength and power and speed and, and flexibility and all the things that we know of in respect to the tenets of overall fitness. You need to have a well-rounded picture of all those things to be able to sit and stand off the floor to you know, playing with your kids as you do. Yeah, I love it. Um, so I wanted to, where's my, I had a, where, sorry, I'm looking over my questions here. Oh, um, so we talked a little bit about the fashion, the intra, right? Um, pretty much every store now, and I mean, even when I go to Whole Foods or King Supers, they're selling foam rollers and mobility tools. I mean, everyone is selling <laughs> trigger point work, mobility tools, you know, whatever, whatever that might be, what are we really doing to our tissue and our bodies when we foam roll or smash muscles? So loaded. I think so you, loaded. you do this just to, just to poke at me. Um, <laughs> well, I'll say it this way. Do, this are we, a, I'll, I'll, I'll make it less loaded, more of a yes or no type of question. Are we, yeah. are we really breaking up scar tissue in our body when we're doing our generalized foam rolling preparation type of work? Uh, no. Um, I, there's little to no evidence to suggest that we're mechanically 
manipulating this network of tissue that I talked about at the beginning, which is the fascial system. Uh, it's unlikely, let's say that from the, the science that we have currently, that we're actually manipulating this fascial system. And it's probably unlikely. And I, I never want to say that we know for certain because the human body, you know, we've been studying it for many, 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 many years. And so, but the, the overall consensus right now is that we're not breaking down fascia. We're not manipulating it mechanically, at least. And we're not breaking down scar tissue because those are the things that people are told is that you want to use this foam roller to break down the scar tissue that's related with X injury or surgery. It's unlikely. Now, are we seeing a difference? Yes. So the answer is twofold. It's no, we're not mechanic, unlikely that we're mechanically releasing fascia or breaking down scar tissue. Are we seeing change? Yes. And that's, that's the conversation that we should be having. Yeah. Now, that being said, though, I mean, obviously, surgery is still more prevalent than ever, if not more than it ever has been, right? How do we do break up scar tissue associated with surgery, right? Because we do know scar tissue is something that is real from uh, mm -hmm. incisions, whatever that might be. Is it more, yeah. is it more likely that we'll be breaking those up with movement in general? Or are there still beneficial components of talking about breaking up scar tissue with massage therapy or, or ex external pressure. Yeah. So don't, uh, let's not misinterpret what I was saying. It's that uh, it's unlikely that we're breaking it up. If that's the terminology that people have been given, can we, can we interact with it? There's maybe the term that I want to share with your, you and your following is that we can manipulate how scar tissue lays down. It's really the, the, the problem with scar tissue is that if it doesn't align itself in the direction of forces, so if we're talking about my biceps muscle that, you know, the fibers run in this vertical direction from my shoulder towards my elbow to be able to flex, to move my elbow, and if scar tissue is laying down in every other way other than in that direction, it becomes an impediment or it, it becomes the barrier that limits your ability to move and it can cause pain. So to say that we can break down the fascia to get it to reorganize is unlikely, but we can manipulate it if we get it early. And there's enough data to support this idea that even post-surgical patients uh, should be manipulating the scar, even the incisions, and there's a safe way of doing so, to be able to start to provide a stress to the body, to be able to start to orient those fibers in the right direction. Um, so scar tissue, like muscle, responds to stress. So if we start early, it's the easiest to be able to orient it and to align it in the, in the appropriate direction. If we're addressing it later, movement has been shown to be the most effective way of starting to reorganize the, the ability for that tissue to align. And we can augment that with our hands or tools. Uh, there's, there's multiple tools that are available from cups, to you know, vibration, to foam rollers, to sticks, to someone's hands, to be able to start to create um, a change to the overall um, system to help to start to reorganize how that scar tissue functions within the area that it's that it's um, residing. So, if I can kind of recap all of that, is that we can manipulate it in a way to organize it early that's preferable uh, and if you're catching it late we need to use manual therapies to be able to restart the healing process uh, along with movement to start to see if we can reorient the ability for that scar tissue to behave more like the existing tissue that was there yeah i i think that's very no, that's yeah, that's perfect that's great i think that's critical too because if we can have better conversations around those those talking points, those that maybe are not seeing the results that they had, they, they have hoped to see maybe progressive timelines, post-op or whatever that might be. They have a better understanding about this. They can be a little bit more encouraged about what can happen, right? Cause if they're not having, if they're still having symptoms or they're not having range of motion, they're like, well, my scar tissue set in and I need to like dig in and smash it and break it up and, mm -hmm. you know, do whatever I can to release it. But if we have a better conversation about, hey, we're if we can play with this stuff, if we can interact with it with the tools, whatever that might be, 
and, and build this in with your movement-based system, this is going to be much more of a progressive uh, program or system for you than just you know, hope crossing your fingers and hoping that all the smashing in the world is going to, is going to melt it all away. Yeah. I, I think that's really important is the education, as you already know, uh, of conveying what the science is telling us um, to be able to share with a patient or client to say, depending on where they are in respect to that scar tissue uh, maturity that, you know, the expectation would be if we catch it early we should have a pretty you know, quick response. If we're catching it after 20 years post-surgical, you know, it, they just need to know that it's gonna take some time, but the evidence is in everyone's favor if they apply the manual techniques on a regular basis along with the movement uh, practice, the combination of those stresses over time will help to organize, and it takes time depending on the, the, the chronicity of it, to be able to help you move even with scar tissue existing in, in the area. Um, it's just more functional scar tissue now and it allows it to behave more like the existing tissue. The, the crux of this conversation is change can be made. It usually is from stress being applied to the body. We just have to decide what is the amount of stress that could be managed over a period of time. That's why you see all these different tools from floss bands to vibration to cupping to foam rolling to going to see a manual therapist to move it with their hands it all comes down to what is the body and the nervous system uh, able to accept and you want to stick with the one that your body can manage and then use that on a on a for the period of time to be able to make that appropriate positive change and i think that i i, I love how you said functional scar tissue right because like you said it's not mm -hmm going away, but we can improve. We can make it better. You can make it so that your task, uh, what was it? Parallel bars, half, I don't know, the flip, <laughs> riding horses, no squatting. Yeah, I made yeah. it up. <laughs> but we get you, we get you back to what you want to be able to do. It's not, it's not a death sentence per se. Uh, I That's love right. that. That's right. Um, movement, lifestyle, health included, what is one thing that most of us could do more of? I know it's, I know that's a very loaded question. And as most of us know, it's kind of a, it depends, but you know, we're over, most of us are overwhelmed. We feel there's not a lot of fat to trim away. And while I don't, well, I don't necessarily maybe agree with that. Most of us tend to lean towards like always, uh, always adding something rather than eliminating. So with that being said, what what's something that we're missing out on maybe as a global population that we really just need to think more of, be more mindful of, or add into our routine? Hmm. Uh, two necessary requirements for us to live, let alone you know, just get through the weekend. Uh, and, and one was kind of highlighted at a recent conference that, that I was just at that I just have misinterpreted for probably the majority of my life. So the two components that I, I'd like to add, because I can't just keep it to one, uh, one is water. Uh, and I'll explain why I think, other than what the obvious reasons why we need water to survive, but uh, water is critical for your movement capacity. And two is breathing. Um, breathing in a way that actually nourishes the body creates stability and decompresses the spine. So let's go back to water to begin with. So I was at a conference. It was the, one of the leading researchers in um, the quantity and quality of the water that we take in. And he was, ex he was sharing some of his frustration in what we're told about waters. People obviously know that they should drink water. But how much is really, and I'm not sure how often you're asked, you know, how much should I drink water or, or if you're yeah. asked, which is another problem. But uh, he brought up this point of our current nutritional guidelines. Have you, uh, so we used to think about in my, when I was ra being raised, it was the pyramid, right? And the pyramid had grains, meats, um, you know, uh, legumes, um, vegetables, and fruits, you know, like those things. And then there was a glass of milk yeah, oh, yeah. next to it, next to the pyramid. And then they, th there's a new guideline 
but none of these guidelines over the last 25 years have really given guidance of how much water we should be taking in and why water is so important to so many different systems, including the muscular system or the movement system, if you want to say that. And so let me just kind of touch on that point is that the majority of our body, as we should all know, is you know, the numbers that are thrown out is that it's about 70% of our weight. But the critical part in respect to our movement capacity of this fascial bag that I'm talking about is that for the skin to move on top of the fascial system that moves on top of the muscles, on top of tendons, ligaments, whatever it may be, for all of these tissues to slide and glide amongst each other requires uh, a channel of fluid in between them. And it's more complex than that, but water is critical to this scenario that if you are dehydrated, even, a, even to a minimal amount, um, your ability to glide becomes limited. So rather than it being really uh, slippery, it becomes more like a gel or the, the way that they explain it, more like honey. And you have the inability for those tissues to slide. And that's what we feel as quote unquote stiffness. I just feel stiff all over, it might be because you're dehydrated. And so I just loved this, this explanation of the importance of water for movement. He definitely described that just a minimal amount of dehydration leads to increase in uh, diabetes or sugar um, issues. Uh, there's an increase in headaches. There's an increase in uh, disc um, symptomology. Like you can go on and on. But, uh, but in respect to movement, water is critical. So that's one thing I think we could add very easily to our, our program. The recommendation that's given was about half of your body weight uh, in ounces. And so mm -hmm. I'm a 230 pound individual. So I'm, I'm pushing 115, you know, 120 ounces a day. And that's kind of what my target is every day. Now, would, 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 well, how do I want to ask this? Would anything increase that amount that you would need to take? Say, for instance, uh, your, I mean, we're, we're saying like in a perfect world, half your body weight announces, right? And you hear of right, others, right. o other things that dehydrate you, right? Now, if you're working out mm -hmm. or exercising, point. you assume that that would go up if you're eating like a higher Absolutely. salt concentration diet or something like that. Cool. So, which is interesting, right? Yeah, great, great, great point. I'd want to add, and so this should be added, and you're absolutely right. So that's the baseline recommendation. Yeah. Uh, I, I sauna every day. Um, nice. And so sauna, obviously, you sweat. And so that, that adds on, um, you know, like, let's say another 20%. Uh, I exercise every day. I'm a heavy sweater. I live in a humid environment in Austin, Texas. There's another add-on. So many add-ons that you can you can add to the recommendation, but we need to have a baseline yeah. level. And so all those other factors need to be taken into consideration. Well, what's funny too, is that that is one of the questions I asked, and now I'm going to dive into it more. I ask social history, right? Anxiety, depression, alcohol, recreational drugs, how much water you drink, how much sleep you get, et cetera, right? And most people's answer is like, not enough. I'm like, well, just like humor me, how much do you actually, you know, we don't even know. And I'm guilty of it too. There's days where I'm like, I haven't had any water and it's four o'clock in the afternoon, it seems like. And then I'll just guggle like, you know, a whole bunch. But that being yeah. said, because I know a lot of my listeners, at least those that have expressed interest, all six of them, that uh, their parents as well, right? Does coffee count? Yeah. He, and so this is the question that was asked as well, is that, uh, this this lecture was at 7 p.m. and there was going to be a uh, cocktail hour after this lecture, which is unfortunate because it's such good information that he provided. Um, I'll get you his contact. But um, the uh, people say, well, how about alcohol and coffee and uh, and the carbonated drinks that we take in? He says all of it counts. Uh, it's unlikely that the amount of caffeine that's in coffee. So going back to your question, will will uh, create a dehydration or a dilution uh, effect that will compromise it. So he counts that as uh, as a component of the 100 or whatever half of your ounces is in your weight. Uh, that being said, the ma the majority of our intake should be from clean, you know, water that we can that we can take in. 
All right, you heard it, folks. Coffee counts. <laughs> he did. He said coffee counts, uh, and which was surprising to me. But he says it's 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 fluid that we're taking in. Obviously, it's going to be somewhat compromised. Um, but I I have I, I was surprised, and I thankfully I drink two cups a day, so that I'm not I'm not too worried about that as well. Yeah. Now uh, I know in past when I've come by your guys' house, do you guys have, do you guys still have that filtration system which uh, changes the uh, the pH of the water? Yeah, we did. We did that for a while. And he actually got up on this idea of the alkaline water. Um, he said that one, there's not enough evidence to support that uh, it it will or will not improve the uh, absorption rate. Uh, he says, our, you know, as we ingest the water into an acidic environment, which should be typically acidic, that is, that is um, it's unlikely that an alkaline drinking alkaline water will make a significant improvement in your outcomes or in your, in your health. But, uh, again, he says, as long as you're drinking water, uh, he's totally fine. And this is like coming from the leading expert in water research, if there is such a thing. Uh, and he joked about that, uh, that title as well, but, uh, <laughs> the alkaline idea of improving your health, probably unlikely from what the lack of the research is telling us. Okay. Well, that's awesome. So, so I'll, we'll kind of leave it at that. We'll, we have, cause I have a, a different interview or uh, a different conversation with another individual where we go into breathing. Most of us know cool. just like anything else, right? Breathing and water like you said, the two, two of the most essential things that you need for life. I would add in their sleep and I'm hoping to get Brandon Marcello on to talk a little bit about sleep. Um, so that would be, yeah. that'd be pretty cool. Um, I, I dude, what, what, we've been going for a while. I love it. This was great. I love how we got into the water aspect though, because I think if anything, this might be the most important conversation for people knowing that the baseline is half of your body weight. And now I'm going to finish this conversation and go chug a bunch of water because I feel like I'm not going to make it today. But I did do my coffee. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I got three kids under five and I am living on <laughs> coffee right now. It's, it's, uh, it's a necessity. So the, the last question though, and again, uh, I, I, sh I should have sent these before because they're kind of big questions where it's such a, okay. there's, there's such a variety of different ways we can go with this. But three pieces of equipment to make you feel better, get stronger, or move better? What would be like, this is like you're like on an island type of thing. I think some of these you may know. Um, uh, definitely a kettlebell. Um, uh, I'm kind of a simpleton when it comes to my movement practice. Uh, a kettlebell, um, an Indian club, mm. um, and... Uh, Gosh, what are the other ones that I and and I think I would go. And so this is crazy, but a rubber band that I can wrap my body with. There you um, go. So the rubber band allows me to use it as a as a resistance tool if necessary, but I also could use it as a manipulation tool using it as a, a floss band. So kettlebell, uh, uh, the Indian club, as well as a rubber band of some sort. There you go. I, I, that's smart because I never normally think about using the floss band as a resistance band, but we were, we were close. Mine was, mine was a kettlebell suspension trainer yeah. or, or rings, some sort of, uh, some that's sort of good. straps. And then I put, I put rock pods. I did the, I did the cups. Do you have a, do you have, do you have some cups? Do you have some cups there you can show them? I, I always do. Yeah. So, uh, uh, so this is the rock tapes version of cupping silicone cups um, the reason why, I mean, like the flossing, you're able to manipulate, uh, connective tissue, fascia, whatever, whatever you want to call it. But I think from a, I love using these from just a desensit desensitization standpoint for those that just have achy yeah. areas, pop a cup on, yeah. go through your movements with clubs or whatever that is, and you get out and you feel amazing. So for, I know, for, I know. So quick little pain mitigations and little, little things like that. I know they do more, but so, so, so beneficial. Um, I agree. Great. Capo, I, dude, I cannot thank you for spending the time with me today. It's always a pleasure chatting with you. We are bummed that you're not long, you are no longer in Colorado, but I hope you guys are having a blast down in Texas. Is there anything else you want to add, share, or ask me before we head out? 
No, I just uh, appreciate the opportunity. It's always good to catch up with you. I hope it's something that I was able to deliver could be useful for people that are watching and uh, reach out to me. Fascia, you know, doc is my handle. You can reach out, direct message me. And if I could help you in any way, I'd, I'd be more than honored to do so. And for, uh, for anyone that is a uh, clinician or coach, um, obviously you can get a hold of uh, Capo on those mediums to chat about what Rock Tape is. But if you go, it's rocktape.com, correct? Correct. Rocktape.com is where you can get a lot of these products. And if you're interested, they do have educational um, courses and content and material. You guys have been dropping a lot of online education too, obviously with this pandemic going on. Uh, yeah. So much, so many resources out there for getting a ton of good information. But that stuff on Rock Tape from the site, all that. You you got to hear it from Capo firsthand today. So thank you so much, man. I appreciate it. Uh, say hi to the fam for me and uh, hopefully we can catch up with you guys soon. Will do. Thank you very much. See ya. All right. Thanks again for joining us on episode four of the Movement Code podcast. It's always such a pleasure for us to chat with Capo, uh, learn from him, and just get a little bit of insight of what he's doing nowadays. As a reminder, your weekly challenge for this week is to up your water intake. Okay, We're looking for half of our body weight in ounces. Obviously, if you're exercising or you live in a specific climate or environment, um, such as Colorado, which is very dry um, and it's very hot and you tend to sweat a lot and you lose extra water, you're going to have to up that water a little bit more. And for the parents out there, coffee still counts. So I am drinking my coffee literally right now as I'm recording this. But we also want to remind you at the beginning of the episode, we are giving away one free movement assessment. Um, you have to do three things. It's going to take you 30 seconds. I promise you, go to Instagram follow movement code, okay? Then you're going to DM us and you're going to send us a message that says movement code 2020. Then you're going to go back to your page or profile and you're going to either post a story or just a regular post about you either doing your, your weekly challenge or you listening to this podcast or maybe moving, but you got to tag us. You got to tag us at movement code, all right? There's only like five listeners, so your chances are pretty good. All right, thanks again for tuning in, guys, and we will see you next week on Episode 6.